In fact, shifting focus now to uh, the first big discussion that we are having in this special broadcast, which is about where does escalation go from here on? Iran's proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah, have been now in a very deep battle with Israel for the last one year. But what has changed is that Iran itself has attacked directly Israel twice in the last one year. Once was an, on 14th of April and now the last couple of days back. 200-odd missiles were uh, uh, they were struck by, from Iran to Israel and uh, there is now growing chatter. I use the word chatter because there's still no confirmation about whether any of this would move ahead. But there's growing chatter amongst various uh, sources and amongst various quarters that maybe this could be headed towards a possible nuclear escalation. Let's discuss this in greater detail and, and let me also in fact tell our viewers about some of the details as far as the military engage, uh, statistics that hold between the two, that is Iran and Israel. Uh, the only thing that Israel has in comparison to Iran in much, much better strength is of course its air defense systems. But let's get in Professor Andrew Latham who is joining us, uh, he's a professor of political science joining us uh, from Carnegie. Thank you so much Professor uh, Andrew for speaking to me and uh, we also in fact have uh, Sharon Haskell, who's a member of uh, the Israeli Senate. It's, of course, the, she's a member of parliament from Israel. Thank you so much, both of you, for speaking to me. And let me start by asking this to you, Professor Andrew, which is that as things stand right now, there is this greater discussion around whether Israel should strike Iran's nuclear capabilities, whether this will expedite Iran's efforts to build a nuclear bomb in the first place. Do you think this launch on launch, which is what essentially the discourse is likely to be, is clearly a step away from any effort whatsoever in de-escalation. I actually don't think de-escalation is in the cards. I think the Israeli government has decided that this is its opportunity to deal with the so-called ring of fire, the axis of resistance, and to degrade it militarily to the point where um, Israel is safer, not safe, but safer than it is uh, in any other circumstances. Uh, I imagine that uh, Israel will launch strikes against the uh, Iran's oil infrastructure, for example. Uh, Eighty-three percent of Tehran's revenues come from oil exports. You, you knock out two ports, that's all it really takes. And the flow of revenue that is supporting Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis and their proxies in Syria and Iran dries up. Um, what I don't imagine happening although I could be wrong, I do not imagine that Israel will strike at Iran's nuclear infrastructure in a meaningful way, primarily because it doesn't have the ability to do so, secondarily because the Americans are really opposed to it, and that doesn't always matter, but I think in this particular, on this particular score it will. Um, and they can achieve many of their aims without going after that uh, Iranian nuclear infrastructure. Now, I'll say very, very quickly, that uh, Iran has been depending on its proxies and on its ballistic missile and uh, cruise missile uh, in, uh, inventory yes. to deter Israel. Both of those have been degraded to the point where it only has a nuclear option. And so my concern is that going forward, uh, Iran might decide this is the moment, and it won't take more than six or eight weeks, okay. to weaponize. Yeah. Six to eight weeks is what Iran may be away from actually building that nuclear capability, worrying for the world because that could possibly mean further escalation. Uh, in fact, Sharon, let me ask you this. There are two questions that I want to ask. One is that uh, do you really agree with what Professor Andrew said that it's going to be the oil facilities that uh, Israel would like to hit, but that could also mean escalation and further escalation. And then Israel, is Israel prepared for those consequences? Look, it's important to note also um, after the report that we have about the conflict that we are at war with Iran since the 8th of October. Hezbollah is an army of Iran. It's been directly attacking Israel for almost a year now. Okay, And we need to make sure that Iran doesn't pose a threat to Israel. Now, Iran now with three facilities, nuclear reactors, is a serious threat to Israel. And we do not want to come to a point where they are actually uh, are an existential threat to our country. Now, it's difficult to say right now what the response is, but I can tell you that it should be that we need to eliminate the danger of Iran 
from our citizens, from our children, from our community. Is Iran doesn't just pose a threat to Israel. Iran is a serious threat for our entire region, and not just. It's a threat to America. It's a threat in South and Central America. Hezbollah is operating in South and Central America as much as it, 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 they controlling the illegal drug and illegal weapon routes. Okay, so understanding how dangerous Iran is, how what its goals are to completely destroy, you know, uh, the the nations of democracy, the na- the free nations. This is a cultural war. This is a religious war against radical Islam. And when you understand that that is their goal, you understand that you are left with no other choice but to eradicate that threat, okay. not just to Israel, but to, you know, to the, all of the society, to humanity. Okay, let me, let me then, uh, Professor Andrew, before I get in some of those uh, numbers talking about the specific military comparisons for our viewers, let me just tell them that Israel, of course, maintains and has the most sophisticated air defense systems, most technologically advanced missile arsenal that exist in this region belong to Israel. A lot of that, of course, is because of its allies, America and U.S. But recently, of course, it, Benjamin Netanyahu has taken a very strong position that even if some of its allies are not willing to give him weapons going forward, he will not back down. And Professor Andrew, then let me ask you this, that uh, in the wake of what uh, Sharon just said, it indicates that this is a war that's in for the long haul. One year into this war, are we any closer to closure than what we were 365 days back? Well, in one sense, if you're looking at ceasefires and de-escalation, no. If you're looking at the ability of Iran and its proxies to attack Israel, yes. Israel has made significant progress. Uh, Hamas, as a military force, is defunct, despite the fact that it lobbed a couple of missiles into Israel today. Hezbollah is on the back foot, but on well on its way to being dismantled. The Israeli air defense system is more than capable of defeating any Iranian cruise missile, or even ballistic missile attacks. Uh, the only real question is, I mean, Israel enjoys escalation dominance up and down that escalation ladder. The only real question is, does Prime Minister Netanyahu believe that he has the skating room that will allow him to attack um, Iran's uh, uh, nuclear infrastructure, recognizing he can't get the most deeply buried facilities. They're just simply beyond Israel's capability. But he can certain, Israelis can certainly degrade that nuclear program. But do you think um, that would be further escalation? Because as things stand right now, yes, Benjamin Netanyahu has a window till about the 5th or 6th of November. That leadership vacuum is what is it's allowing Israeli leadership to take more bold decisions. But do you think going for the juggler, could probably require even the Iranian leadership to then respond in a much larger way than what it has done so far? Um, they would like to, but they have demonstrated that they really don't have the ability to uh, strike back any more than they have thus far. Hmm. Uh, their missile attacks have come to nothing. Uh, they could up the ante in that respect, but I think uh, Israel is more than capable of, of, of defeating that kind of an escalation. Um, the Israelis enjoy complete air supremacy. The Iranian Air Force is, is vintage 1979. Exactly. And their air, their air defense system as well. So anytime Iran tries to up the ante, Israel dominates that next rung uh, militarily and, uh, and geopolitically. I, I, see, I see that April attack when uh, Tehran declared victory and that was the end of it because they knew they had no other options. Absolutely. Um, yeah. There are also fault lines when, within this region that I'm going to come back to in just a bit. A weakened Iran makes sense for America as well. There is, of course, a, a weakened Iran also means that there is no leadership within the Muslim world that Iran and Turkey really jostle for that uh, is then up for grabs. And also at the end of the day, there is a pro-West and anti-West lobby within this entire Muslim region as well. So it's not a monolith, but we're going to come back and talk about that in just a bit. Uh, Sharon, that, let me ask you this uh, two questions. What Professor Andrew said is absolutely correct, that Iran's military capability is much less when it comes to Israel. But what I want to ask you is the fact that a year into pounding into Gaza and uh, pounding uh, both uh, Hamas as well as Hezbollah, the fact that they've been able to strike back indicates 
their ability to recoup faster than what Israel estimated. Would you think so? So the thing is that when you try and dismantle a terrorist organization, specifically also the way how Iran works, uh, not just in Lebanon, but in Syria and Iraq, they're not setting just a proxy like a terrorist organization or a military that can actually fight physically, but they also uh, uh, create a political power, political parties and influential structures in that country so that they can actually control it. For example, Hamas is not just a military. They're also holding key position in government that allows them to indoctrinate, incite, and control an entire population. From that population, they indoctrinated, they are capable of recruits, terrorists, into their army of terror. Okay? So you cannot just fight military, but you have to understand that this fight has to be from a leadership, from a point of uh, a strategic uh, political influence as well. And that's why with Hezbollah, we made the grave mistake of uh, 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 not dismantling the shipment of arms that was coming into Lebanon to the point where they pose a serious threat on Israel. Let so me ask this. Let me ask this to Professor Alex. Now. Let me ask this I, to just, Professor I Alex. Finish, I, I just want to finish my point about mm. it, that we cannot allow Iran another five or ten years to actually bypass us and pose an existential threat on Israel. It's not just about, you know, the balance of, of military at this point, but it is what it's going to look like in five it's or It's an ten existential years. crisis. It's an existential crisis for Israel, which probably one, uh, you know, uh, would lead to ask about political solutions to a military conflict. Is that what it should be? But I want to get in Professor Alex as well, Director of Iran Program, uh, joining us uh, from uh, Tehran, born uh, Washingtonian, in fact. Uh, uh, Professor Alex, that as things stand right now, I want to talk about what happens going forward. Both Israel and Iran, are they headed towards a deeper conflict that could possibly escalate? Are we on the verge of seeing that escalation, given the fact that ceasefire seems to be nowhere on the table right now. Professor Alex. Thank you. It's great morning from Washington. Look, I, I think neither side clearly wants uh, all out conflict. I think the Iranian side clearly appreciates that war with Israel very, very likely means war with the United States and uh, Israel's other Western uh, partners, allies, those countries out there that support Israel. The Iranians can't afford it. And I think the Iranian regime really wants to stick to the game plan of before, which is a long-term protracted war bleeding Israel over years to come and avoid conflict right now. That's the Iranian game plan. Hasn't changed. If you listen to Ali Khamenei, the Iranian Supreme Leader speech on Friday, he pretty much said that. From Israel's point of view, look, they would love to see regime change in Tehran tomorrow, but Israel can do this on its own. That's just obvious to anyone. And the United States right now, if you look at this country, is not ready to enter a conflict on that scale in the Middle East. So those two realities basically make me wonder that even though, as you said, it's true, right now suspension of hostilities is not on the cards, but that might well be the only way out of this. And you have to wait and see if the Israelis, the Iranians, uh, will come to that conclusion sooner rather than later. Then let me ask you this, Professor Ale Alex, which is that, is, is this going to expedite Tehran's efforts to build that nuclear weapon and, and its arsenal that it's been working towards? I know, I know building a nuclear capability is not just about turning a couple of screws, it's much more than that. But will this expedite that process? It might, it might. Look, the Iranian nuclear program is about a quarter century old, at least. Uh, and no country in the history of man has taken this long to produce a nuclear weapon. I mean, this is Second World War technology. You don't need that much time. So it's a political decision in Tehran. It's a political decision if they want to have a nuclear weapon or not. I think as of today, their calculation is that it will cost Iran more in terms of strategic interests. For example, it could cre create an arms race in the region. Countries like Turkey, Saudi Arabia, UAE, others might want to weaponize. That's not necessarily a good thing from Iran's perspective. And on top of that, you got to worry about America's reaction. United okay. States has set the red line. Absolutely. Uh, Sharon, I want to give you the quick closing comment. Uh, it is 7th of October. It is still a very harsh 
truth that Israel is commemorating this day, even though 50 of those hostages are yet to be freed. Last word for you on the show before we take a break. And so we still are longing to bring back more than 100 hostages that are being held by Hamas in the dungeons of torture. Uh, this is our main goal. We didn't want this war, but the 7th of October was a declaration of war, not just by Hamas, but by Iran. What you've seen, these are war and still are the first days or the first, uh, 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 you know, uh, scene of the war with Iran. We are fighting against radical Islam, the hatred towards our culture, our values, freedom, minorities' rights, women's rights, freedom of press, freedom of religion. This is what they are actually fighting against. The Indeed. war against radical Islam is spreading all around the world. And I know that India has been struggling with that a lot as well. And Absolutely. So, radical so Islam, times, actually radicalization is, is something that Israel is dealing with and needs to address. And, and then, of course, there are larger issues. Sharon, thank you so much for speaking to me. Professor Alex, if you could stay. Thank you very and much. Professor Andrew, if you could stay for a quick comment after this very short break. We come back to talk more about, well, what happens in terms of United States in the present game? Is it losing its leadership? Is it creating a vacuum? And is it allowing Benjamin Netanyahu to take gambles? that probably his government wouldn't have taken otherwise. We come back and talk more. Stay with us.